God, you are good. God, you are good. God, you are good. God, you are good. I need help. 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 So do they. So do they. So do they. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm bringing the message today from a delightful church in Blockley, England. This congregation has a history older than a thousand years. In fact, the earliest structures in this particular location date back to 600 AD. People have been meeting in this particular building, at least portions of it, to worship since a thousand AD which makes this church almost as old as some of you members of Oak Hill's church. The great news is that we have an opportunity to bring the message to you today from such a significant location as this. The bad news is only one person came to church, and that's my wife, Deanlin, and she's suffering from jet lag. But we continue today a series of messages that we have begun on prayer. It's called Your Best Ten Minutes, a series on prayer for people who struggle to pray. I think that all of the prayers of the Bible can be reduced down to a simple sentence. And that sentence goes like this. God, you are good. I need help. So do they thanks. And as we live with this simple prayer for just a few minutes every day, we go deeper into each one of these phrases. God, you are good. You're my daddy, we studied last week. And today, you're in charge. You're in charge. Something happens when we acknowledge that God is in charge. To acknowledge the authority of Christ is to stir bravery in our hearts, something that all of us need. I certainly needed bravery. I was nine years old and the scream was stuck in my throat. I opened my mouth to scream and nothing came out. My mouth was wide, but no sound. I was so afraid I couldn't even get the scream out of my mouth. Yellowstone Park family vacation. We had seen Old Faithful. We had fed the bears. We had fished for trout. And now it was the middle of the night and I was asleep in my tent when I heard what I certainly believed was a grizzly bear outside of my tent. My mother had warned us, be sure and put the food away so that no bears comes looking for midnight snacks. Well, I think a bear came looking for a midnight snack and that bear was smelling me. Thanks to the still flickering fire, I could see the silhouette or the shape of a bear standing up outside my tent. Oh, can you imagine my fear? Of course you can. Because bears lurk outside your tent. Grizzlies still come, challenges still stay nearby. Intruders still keep us awake. In fact, here's an important question. What fears are you facing? I conducted a sidewalk survey this week that consisted of just one question. What fears are you facing today? Here are some of the answers. The fear of outliving my children. The fear of being diagnosed with a terminal disease. Bankruptcy a nuclear attack, a permanent disability, an extra long sermon by Max. I told Deanland that was not an appropriate answer. But we all have fears. Joy sucking, life leeching, sleep stealing, faith testing, calamities. And the only response to all of the challenges that we have in life is fear. Or is it? Perhaps there's another response. A response I came across just a few weeks ago when I was boarding a flight for yet a different trip. As I was getting on the plane, I heard someone call my name. I turned and it was the airline pilot, the pilot of the airplane. 
Max, you're on my flight, he said. I turned and it was Joe, an old friend of mine. I call him the Methuselah of the airways. This guy has been flying planes as long as this chapel has been in existence. He, he flew in Vietnam. He's flown courier service planes, private planes. He's been a commercial pilot for many years. I've heard all of his stories. We've shared a lot of coffee and he's told me how he's faced everything from emptying fuel tanks to turbulent storms. <laughs> well, we chatted for a few minutes and I went to my seat really with a smile on my face thinking, well, this plane is in good hands and I know the pilot and there's nothing this plane is gonna face that Joe can't face. Well, boy, did that news come in handy because about a half an hour into the flight, we sailed right into a wall of wind that kind of turbulence that causes the plane to drop like, a, like an elevator that's out of control. It just, we just had those sudden drops. Well, people were gasping, some people screamed, dentures were shaking. Actually, I wasn't afraid. I, I wasn't happy, I didn't enjoy it, but, but I didn't feel the fear that everyone else felt because I had an advantage. I knew the pilot. I knew Joe. I knew the name of the person who was flying the plane. And I trusted his authority. I trusted his ability. I trusted his strength. You see, bravery is born when we know who is in charge. That's why the theme of authority of Christ matters most. Where there is fear, there is confusion, about authority. Where there is courage, there is confidence about authority. So this question about who is in charge of the universe is the most important question that we wrestle with. How do you answer that question? When you think about who occupies the cockpit of history, who flies the plane of humanity, how do you answer that question? Who is in charge? Maybe your answer is, well, no one is. No one's in charge. That's a popular answer today, a, a secularistic answer. There is no God. There is no person flying the plane. And well, that's one response, but I got to tell you, that leads to a lot of fear. If no one is in charge, then everything is just random, accidental. Uh, there is no sequence. There is no control. There is no predictable history. Another answer to that question is, well, yeah, someone is in charge. We are. It's up to education. It's up to government. It's up to science. And so we make science our savior. We make education our liberator. We make the government our God. We all know what happens when that happens. Because people disappoint people. Policies fail. The best intentions come apart. Organizations squabble and fight, and we are left dealing with even more fear. If we are in charge, what comfort is that? It's kind of like all the passengers trying to fly that plane. We needed someone to be in charge. Or there are some people who say the devil is in charge. An evil spirit, a malevolent force is in charge. That doesn't bring much comfort, does it? So this question is the question, and that is, who is in charge? And to this question, Jesus Christ gives a definitive and a confident answer. He says, I am. I am in charge. The Bible presents Jesus as one with unimpeachable authority. Look with me at the authority of Jesus. From Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 and 22, God raised Christ from death and set Him on a throne in deep heavens in charge of running the universe. Everything from galaxies to governments, no name and no power exempt from His rule. And not just for the time being, but forever. He is in charge of it all. He has the final word on everything. Jesus has complete authority. John 1.3 says, All things were made by Him, and nothing was made without Him. 
That means the tiniest microbe to the mightiest mountain. Jesus made them all. Hebrews 1.3 says He sustains everything by the mighty power of His command. Not only did He create everything, He keeps everything in motion just by His word, by His command. He manages the seasons and tides. He oversees wildlife and sea life. Philippians 2.9, God raised Him up to the heights of heaven and gave Him a name that is above every other name. Christ is running the show right now. A meteor just streaked through a distant galaxy. Christ caused it to do so. A giraffe just took its first breath in the Congo. Christ caused it to do so. And He knows how many breaths that giraffe is going to take in her lifetime. The migration of the belugas in the oceans. Christ dictates their itinerary. He has authority over the world. And listen, He has authority over your world. Over your world over your emotions, over your sleep patterns, over your eating habits. <laughs> he knows everything about you. He has authority over every detail of your life. He knows the good, He knows the bad, and He has the authority to use both to increase your faith, to develop your character, and to expand His kingdom. The scripture says in Matthew 10, 29, not even a sparrow worth only half a penny can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. He's the command center of the galaxies. Did you know one time he pulled a coin out of the mouth of a fish? Another time he stopped the waves just with a word. Another time he spoke and a tree became barren. He spoke a different time and a basket became a buffet. He controls everything from economy to ecology to food supply to meteorology. Jesus is the one who oversees the universe. He can list the name of the stars and He can tell you how many pebbles there are as easily as you and I can count to ten. He's the source of every virtue. He's in charge. The government once tried to intimidate Him and they failed. The devil tried to kill Him and, they, and He failed. The scripture says even death was no match for him. And when Jesus marched out of the grave, Satan scampered out of the cemetery and he's been running ever since. Jesus disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory on the cross. Colossians 2.15 And he was not kidding when he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Authority. Authority. And so the question, who's in charge? Who occupies the cockpit? Who's flying this plane? Scripture gives just one answer, and that is Jesus Christ. Now what difference does this make? Oh, this makes all the difference in the world. I want to show you a story of someone in the Bible who really got this. And this is the faith of the officer. He was an officer in the Roman army. He was what was called a centurion which meant that he had a hundred men who answered uh, whenever he made a request. He was a part of the Roman army. Uh, boy, you didn't mess around in the Roman army. You talk about a disciplined force that Caesar used to lead and to change the world. And so he understood authority. And he came to Jesus, the soldier did, the officer did, and he had a request. He said, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. Now this is interesting. Jesus, knowing that the man had a friend or a servant, a slave at his home who was sick, said, I will come and heal him. But the soldier said, no, you don't even have to come. He said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes, to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. The centurion was saying, hey, I know how authority works, because I have authority. I tell my soldier, saddle my horse, he saddles my horse. I tell my soldiers, prepare for battle, they prepare for battle. I tell them to jump, they say, how high? I understand authority. 
I know authority, I see authority, and I recognize authority when I see it in Jesus Christ, I see it in you. Only speak the word, he says. Just speak the word and he will be healed. Jesus was stunned. Jesus was moved. Jesus was amazed. Finally, somebody gets it. Jesus marveled, the scripture says, and said to those who followed, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Go your way as you have believed, so let it be done to you. And his servant was healed at that same hour. Jesus says, I have not seen such faith in all of Israel, which is to say he's been looking for this kind of faith. He's been looking for people who would trust his authority. Folks, he still is. He still is. He's looking for people who will come to Him with their problems, with their fears, with their turbulent airplane flights, who will come to Him with a prayer and say, you're in charge, Jesus. You're in charge. Only speak the word. Just speak the word. Remember, you do not come to Jesus as a stranger. You don't come to Jesus as an interloper, as an outsider. He's your Father. God, you're good. You're my Daddy. You're my Abba. You have already declared that you're a part of His family. You're trusting Him like a child would a father. It is right now for you to say, now you're in charge. Just speak the word. You see, faith and fear cannot inhabit the same heart. Faith and fear cannot inhabit the same heart. When fear sees faith, faith goes out the back door. When fear sees faith walk in, fear turns and leaves. Now some of you have been living in fear too long. You wake up in fear, you go to sleep in fear. Your day is marked by anxiety. That's why these prayer, this prayer is so important for you to say, Lord, I believe you're in charge. I believe it's not the devil. I believe I'm not in charge. I believe the the cockpit is not vacant, but I believe you are in charge. And as you make that statement of faith, you're going to find fear leaving and faith coming. So I encourage you, open the door to faith. Open the door to faith. Do what I did with Joe, the pilot. Ponder his accomplishments. When when the plane started bouncing, I began thinking of all the things that Joe told me about how he had faced one challenge after another. And I thought, Joe's not afraid. And if Joe's not afraid, I'm not going to be afraid. When your fears surface, then you just think of everything that Jesus has faced. You think of all his accomplishments. You think of the creation. You think of the mighty history of this world. You think of the mountains he has made. Think of him on the earth facing challenges defying demons, feeding hungry people. There is nothing you and I face that He cannot face. So, face Him most. Say, you're in charge. My cancer's not in charge, Jesus. You're in charge. The economy's not in charge. You're in charge. My grumpy husband's not in charge. You're in charge. And my moody spirit is not in charge. You're in charge. And then just ask Him. Ask Him. Say, speak the word, Lord. Won't you speak the word? Speak the word. My water bill is due. Speak the word. My children are late. Speak the word. My arthritis is back. Speak the word, Lord. Invite faith to come into your life. Invite faith to come in. I wish I could say that I've always done this and excelled in it every challenge that I faced in my life. I can't say that. But I remember one time in particular early in my ministry in which I chose to trust instead of to be anxious. And God honored that faith. Our oldest daughter, Jenna, was born in Brazil. What a delight and what a surprise and what a bundle. But then right after uh, we brought her home from the hospital, we got a second surprise and that was a hospital bill that we could not pay. 
Our insurance would not pay for the hospital bill. To this day, I haven't figured out the conflict. But it was a stateside insurance company and something about the hospital that we picked in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and they would not pay. We were left with a $1,500 hospital bill. You say, Max, that's not very much for what it costs to have a baby born. I tell you what, that's a lot if all you have to your name is $1,500. That's exactly how much money I had. I was a young married man with a brand new baby in a foreign country and I had been able to save up for rainy day fund $1,500. And here they needed $1,500. If I pay the bill, I'll be broke. But what could I do? About that time, I was studying prayer. Really for the first time in my whole life, I was trying to understand prayer. And what God was teaching me was to trust to trust. So I can remember the day that I wrote the, t the check and I, I mailed, the, mailed the check to the hospital and I, I don't know if I told Deanlin or maybe I just had the thought, well, I'm broke. <laughs> I'm broke. Hope her parents don't find out. I've got a baby and a, a wife in a foreign country and don't have a penny to my name. But I was determined to trust, not get anxious. A few days later, I received an invitation to, to travel from Brazil to Florida uh, to speak at a church retreat. Of all things, it was the only time, the entire time of the five years we lived in Brazil, that I received an invitation to go and speak at a church retreat. I mean, it's kind of expensive to fly somebody from Brazil to Florida. And I thought, well, maybe this is part of the answer to my prayer. So I boarded the flight on a Wednesday. I flew, got there on Thursday, and I spoke on Friday and Saturday and Sunday. And I got on the plane to fly back to Brazil. And one of the men in the church who I hardly knew, I had met him, but I didn't know him well. He approached me as I was leaving and he handed me an envelope and he said, this is for your, for your work in Brazil. That wasn't uncommon. It was very common for people to you know, give us a $25 or $50 to help us with our work. And I was very grateful, very grateful. But I honestly didn't think anything about it. In fact, I put the envelope in my coat and was flying home before I remembered, oh, the man gave me an envelope. I wonder what it was. I opened it up. Yes, you got it. You guessed it. $1,500 to the penny. Much more valuable to me than the replenished rainy day fund was the gesture of God to me that I have never forgotten. And that is, He has absolute authority. He has absolute authority. And when troubles come, my first response and your first response must be this, Lord, you're in charge. You see, we tornado His ability to help us when we freak out. We torpedo everything that could happen if we resist and resort to fear. We go against His work when we respond in anxiety instead of peace. Now, every single one of you today have fears. Every single one of you. Here's my challenge to you. Take those fears to Christ. Take them to Him first. Do what the centurion did. Do what the soldier did. And say, you're in charge. You just speak the word, Lord, and my servant will be healed. Will He give you the exact $1,500 that you need? Listen, it's out of my pay grade to tell you how God is going to help you. But I know this, He will help you. He will help you. Because He's in charge. And He's your daddy. He helped me that night in Yellowstone. Yep, that grizzly bear that I told you about. Well, as a nine-year-old, I didn't know what to do. I was so afraid I couldn't scream, couldn't climb out of the sleeping bag, and I wasn't about to climb out of the sleeping bag anyway. And so I just said, God, help me, help me, help me. I closed my eyes, I squeezed them so tight, and I prayed so long that eventually I fell asleep. When I woke up, the sun was up. My family was up, my mom was up, my dad was up, so I climbed out of the tent. And I went straight over to the picnic table where she was cooking breakfast and I told her what had happened. I said, Mom, there was a bear outside of the tent last night. She said, are you sure that was a bear? And she pointed at a sweatshirt that she had hung up on a clothesline. 
kind of like a standing bear. She said, I think all you saw was the silhouette of that sweatshirt with the fire behind the sweatshirt. Boy, the family had a big laugh. Little Max freaked out over a grizzly bear last night. To this day, though, I'm not convinced. To this day, I wonder, did I see a sweatshirt? Or maybe, did I see a bear? And I was the only one who saw the bear. And when I prayed, God heard my prayer. I guess I'll never know. But I do know this, that when we pray, God takes over. And so God, that's our prayer today. We believe that you are good. We believe that you are our daddy. And we believe that you're in charge. We need help, Lord. Won't you please bring us healing, encouragement? Won't you lead us and pardon us? Our friends need help as well. Would you strengthen them, please? Those we love, even those we don't. And dear Lord, please be with this hurting, hurting world in which we live. Thank you for all you have done. In Jesus' name.